Uh, hello, welcome back to the Ukrainian Studies Organization. Uh, I'm Natalia Shpilova Said, and thank you so much for attending our talk uh, today. I'm very happy to welcome again uh, Serhii Zhuk. Um, Serhii Zhuk participated in our series last year, and today he will be presenting on Ukraine, the KGB, espionage, and meddling in American politics 1960s, 1980s. Sergei Zhuk, a former Soviet expert in U.S. history with special focus on the social and cultural history of colonial British America, moved in 1997 to the United States and defended his Ph.D. dissertation about Imperial Russian history at Johns Hopkins University in 2002. Since 1997, he taught American colonial history. Russian, Soviet, and Ukrainian history at Ball State University, the University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins University, and Columbia University. His research interests are international relations, knowledge production, cultural uh, consumption, religion, popular culture, and identity in history of Imperial Russia, Ukraine, and the Soviet Union. Sergei Zhuk's scholarship was awarded with numerous research grants, including Kennan Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, Rockefeller Foundation, Fulbright Mellon Foundation, Yatsik and Timkib Ukrainian Studies grants from the University of Toronto, and Harriman Institute. Columbia University. Just recently, he was invited as a Fulbright Scholar to teach in 2022 in Estonia. Uh, like always, we'll start with the lecture. Please submit your comments and questions via Q&A option. All questions and comments will be addressed during our discussion. If you would like to participate in our discussion directly, please use our function raise hand. At this point, I would like to again welcome um, uh, Serhii Zhuk. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Natasha, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to promote uh, my uh, upcoming book. So I am uh, very greedy. <laughs> I, I would like to use this video to uh, invite you to read my book, which will be um, out uh, at the end of April, this April, in London, New York, in Rutledge. Uh, publishing company and um, what I, I, I'm going to discuss today is one of the major topic of this book. Um, it's called, uh, I had different uh, title at the beginning, but finally my editor selected just one catchy phrase, KGB operations against the United States and uh, Canada and Soviet Ukraine after Stalin. So a few words about why I uh, decided to publish this uh, book. I am not an expert in intelligence. I am not uh, an expert in CIA KGB confrontation. Um, I was not trained uh, in any way uh, as a historian of intelligence service or history of spying. Of course, as a normal human being, I loved uh, James Bond movies and uh, other films about spies, including Soviet and post-Soviet uh, films about this. But uh, uh, the major reason why I began uh, to write this book, because when I uh, almost finished uh, my book about Dipritrovsk, Rock and Roll's Rocket City, and um, uh, I used KGB uh, reports to Dnipropetrovsk uh, party uh, personnel. I decided to go to SBU uh, archive in Kyiv um, in 2009. And plus, I uh, began writing a book about Soviet Americanists, and I need to find some material in SBU. And I decided if uh, Dnipropetrovsk archive open all these documents uh, about KGB reports, it sh they should be uh, available in Kyiv. And I was shocked because uh, people from SBU, Služba Bezpek Ukraine, Service of uh, Security of Ukraine, its uh, success of KGB, behave like KGB people. Actually. They uh, knew that I am from, uh, although I'm Soviet Ukrainian uh, historian, but still for them, uh, I, I was, uh, uh, historian from there, from the West, from um, United States. 
And they did not allow me to, to do this. Um, so for me, it was short because uh, I, I plan to finish my uh, another book, uh, which I divided into parts. Uh, one book about my teacher, Balkhavitinov from M Moscow, another about Soviet American, it's more popular version of the same text, uh, frankly speaking. But I, I was missing this archival darkness. I knew that one, uh, character of my uh, book was Shlipakov, who everybody knew was working for a KGB, like uh, Moscow Arbatov, uh, Sivachov, and other people who were directly related to KGB. Uh, and I knew that Moscow would not allow me to do this. And I, I, I was actually very frustrated. And finally, when uh, in 2015, um, uh, SBU archives were open, I went there. And again, I decided to write a new project uh, about culture called war and Soviet Ukraine from Stalin to, um, to Gorbachev. And this was my major reason. But the more I began reading all these files, the more I uh, uh, moved in different direction. I decided to use, use these files. Uh, the second reason why I changed my plans because of this scandal of open Russian interference in not only in my Ukraine affairs, but in uh, politics of the United States, when they try to fund the uh, uh, people who were voted for Trump, when they try to interfere and push um, this uh, public opinion in direction uh, of Trump against Hillary. Well, everybody knew that uh, Mr. Putin hated Hillary Clinton, but it was so obvious uh, this difference, although Russians used to deny, like now, just recently, I watched this press conference, Lavrov, a blink and Lavrov uh, behave like a ribbon trope, you know, denying no, 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 we no threat to uh, Ukraine. It looks like they did not take Crimea, did not take um, Eastern Donbass. What is there? So, but anyway, so the second reason was to find something about a typical interference of KGB in political affairs of American uh, countries, North American countries. And I found a lot. Uh, plus, um, I decided to uh, not to touch um, Trump story because it's it's very uh, popular, and you can go to Google and you can find a lot of material about uh, Trump visiting Leningrad in 1888, and you can find documents uh, of Interist Soviet uh, tourist uh, agency uh, paying for Trump and his wife. In 1888, so it's not a big secret. It's only uh, people who vote for Trump they do not want to um, accept this. Plus, it's too political science. I'm a historian, so uh, the, the second reason this my just historian uh, curiosity about these connections of a Russian secret service, Soviet secret service, and American businessmen, American politicians. Um, uh, it, it's triggered my attention, and I found a lot of these uh, documents. First, uh, I found how, uh, for example, uh, Soviet KGB tried to fund uh, Democratic candidates, uh, representatives of uh, Democratic Party in 1968, because Soviet Union was afraid of conservative Nixon. In those days, they hated the Republicans, and they tried to um, uh, use any candidate, especially Hubert Humphrey uh, from uh, the Democratic Party. I knew about this from uh, an, uh, from Anatoly Dobrynin memoirs. Anatoly Dobrynin was uh, uh, Soviet ambassador to the United States, but I found so much uh, attention, so many details about how KGB agents, KGB officers organized these operations uh, against uh, American diplomats, American politicians, inviting them to Kyiv, 
uh, trying to create this positive image of the Soviet Union. Uh, and the document is called Создать хорошее впечатление выгодном нам направлении to create, to impress Americans. And uh, uh, 68, 69 um, uh, were typical years of this very intense Soviet uh, interference in political affairs. So I decided to concentrate on this because it's obvious meddling uh, um, how Soviet um, KGB provided actual free um, uh, excursions, uh, free meals. Well, for us, it sounds weird. Uh, free um, accommodations for these people who represent the Democratic Party in 68, 69, many of them. So they lived like uh, uh, Trump in 1988 in Leningrad for free. So I realized it's, it's typical uh, Soviet um, style. It's a model. It's a pattern. Uh, number three reason for why I decided why I decided to uh, write this uh, because I was trained as Soviet Americanist, and my uh, teacher and dear friend was Nikolai Balkhavitinov, who, who had problems with KGB, and who shared his stories with me about how KGB tried to. Um, uh, persecute him, and uh, uh, I and he mentioned very interesting aspect of Soviet American studies. He told me, Seryoja, nobody studied Soviet American relations from uh, this site of intelligence operations, how KGB and CIA. Uh, actually treated each other, how they participated in development of these um, uh, of these relations, Soviet American relations. So I found a lot of material about uh, CIA, KGB, not just confrontation, but also collaboration. I give you just two examples. In 1960, Soviets were ready to uh, receive Dwight Eisenhower in Kiev in June 1960. It was response to official Khrushchev's visit to the United States. And you can to find tons of documents how suddenly CIA and KGB, Secret Service of the Soviet Union and Secret Service of the United States collaborated. They started this collaboration with um, uh, events of Khrushchev's uh, visit to the United States in 1959. And you can find a plenty of uh, material about this in uh, uh, Washington archives, in national archives. But uh, we have many documents about this planning visit of 1960 to Kyiv. Um, and it was a real collaboration when uh, CIA Offices provided documents about uh, civil rights activists in Kyiv uh, trying to uh, prevent the demonstrations against uh, this meeting of Khrushchev and Eisenhower in Kyiv. Uh, how uh, both KGB uh, people and CIA people exchange information. But because of U2 scandal, probably. Uh, those people who younger than us forgot about this scandal uh, in uh, on May first, nineteen sixty, Soviets shot down uh, American intelligence airplane U two, and they um, took this pilot um, who was responsible for the separation and used him as a tool against the United States. It was a scandal. So this visit was terminated. But despite this failure, uh, 12 years later, in 1972, KGB and CIA planned another visit. Uh, in this case, Richard Nixon in June uh, 1972 to Kiev. And uh, we have files and files of information uh, about this uh, collaboration, about the changing plans, about 
this revelations when um, a secret agent from the United States uh, revealed how they hated at the beginning United Soviet Union and then and fell in love with uh, Ukrainian uh, weather, Ukrainian people, Ukrainian uh, city, and so on. And at the same time, a KGB uh, had their own experience. It was like discovery of different countries because they exchanged their stories, what kind of education was in the United States, what kind of films they watched, how they lived, uh, how many cars they have actually for KGB agents were shocked when they discovered that the uh, office of the rank could have two cars, but the KGB office in Kiev had none, no car at all. And so it's, it's, it's interesting kind of cultural history of uh, exchanging between these uh, two services, KGB and CIA. And uh, th this uh, was another reason why I decided to uh, postpone this cultural history, uh, cultural Cold War project and concentrate on KGB uh, operations. And uh, finally, uh, Frank, I discovered familiar names um, in, this, uh, in these uh, files. I discovered names of people whom I knew, for example, Shlipakov, uh, from Kiev, I found his reports and his participation in technological espionage as early as 1962. I found uh, how, um, uh, how KGB tried to use uh, various operations against Michael Lee's in Dnipropetrovsk, against, for example, Yuri Mitzik, uh, my professor from my student in era and so on. So I concentrated on these documents and eventually um, this book became a very interesting archival based sequel to two previous projects of mine. One about culture consumption and young people in closed city. Uh, it was my book, Rock and Roll in the Rock and City. And another is Soviet Americana about how uh, Soviet Secret Service used Soviet intellectuals um, about if, uh, in their campaigns uh, uh, against uh, United States. And again, I already mentioned that uh, I discovered before this documents about uh, Arbatov serving KGB, um, about Sivachov. Uh, being engaged in this, actually, Sivachov created the entire school of Soviet Americanists, which still uh, exists, and many of his students now teach in many cities uh, of the world, uh, in the United States, in London, in the United Kingdom, and everywhere. So it's it's very interesting um, connection. So um, as a result, I uh, uh, organized my material, which I found uh, in nine chapters. And uh, I used two of the most important collections. One is counterintelligence uh, fund. It's number one fund. It's, it's a fund devoted to fight with uh, Razvedka, with intelligence from the West, from the United States, from Britain, from other countries of the world. And the second uh, pile, it's huge uh, amount of documents, it's uh, correspondence between KGB leaders and um, Ukrainian Communist Party personnel, leaders such as uh, Shellist, uh, who was very, actually, very reactionary. We, we used to um, create this image, positive, nationalistic, uh, patriotic Shellist, but he was piece of, uh, sorry for this uh, language, uh, he was not very good and he hated America, hated any democratic uh, reforms, probably you know better than I do how he um, supported uh, Soviet attack on Prague Spring, participation and suppression. But he did uh, the same with suppression of um, uh, patriotic movement in uh, you, 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 you Soviet Ukraine. For me, it was shock. I knew about uh, this uh, legendary block 
uh, opposition, which was created under Sherbitsky KGB rule, but it's not true. According to my documents, uh, many documents which build this, actually it's completely imaginary, you know, block something like alliance against Soviet uh, Ukrainian culture. Uh, this uh, operation uh, against um, uh, Soviet intelligence in Ukraine uh, started on the shadows. Do not forget that because we sometimes tend to idealize shellist vis-a-vis Sherbitsky. Both represent the same trend. Only this guy spoke Ukrainian, this uh, was not. And, uh, and um, uh, this is um, another very important uh, moment which uh, I did. So my, 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 my um, discovery. So I will concentrate on, we still have uh, time, I will concentrate on few major discoveries which actually completely change my perception of KGB existence and KGB operation. Um, first, um, and it, it's, it's very important, uh, KGB was not just a bunch of uh, ignorant, uh, stupid, um, anti-Western uh, you know, people. It's not true. Yes. Uh, local operatives uh, in Dnipropetrovsk, in Zaporizhia, in Kyiv, who were involved in operation against uh, youth culture probably missed something. But the um, bosses and people who were connected to this uh, intelligence operation in uh, America were not. They were uh, very intelligent. Uh, they used very important uh, information. For example, um, in my um, uh, chapter on Soviet use and um, uh, KGB, I uh, found wonderful exam uh, or wonderful study. It's called uh, examination, but it's study. Study of uh, young people, college people, college student life in 1968 Odessa with very good uh, sociological um, uh, analysis, which discovered that as early as 67, Soviet young people were already commercialized, westernized, and very anti-Soviet. They used Komsomol Communist Party only for their own career. And it was a, a report to Shellist, and Shellist did nothing. So KGB officers told him how dangerous Americanization, Westernization of Soviet youth cultures early 1968. So Soviet leadership was lagging behind, not KGB. Uh, another uh, uh, discovery for me was uh, how successful KGB operations were against two major enemies, uh, Ukrainian diaspora in America and, and uh, Jewish diaspora in America and Israel. And again, I need to explain uh, why I use two North American countries, not just United States. It's a mistake when we try to separate our study of these countries from our research uh, of Soviet period uh, for Soviet ideology, for their practitioners, practitioners of this ideology, and uh, for KGB, the major enemy of Soviet Ukraine were two imperialist countries, Canada and United States. And if you, for example, explore taxonomy of uh, Soviet research, you will see that Americanistic American studies include, first of all, these two countries, United States and Canada, and for uh, Soviet uh, KGB, of course, in Ukraine. Uh, these two countries represented major threat. They were invested because majority of um, uh, Ukraine diaspora lived there in these two countries, in Canada and United States. And uh, uh, KGB organized various uh, operations against these two communities, uh, Ukrainian communities and Jewish communities, 
trying to um, start this um, war between them, provoking them, undermining them. The major uh, strategy of KGB operations against uh, these diasporas was old uh, Roman rule, divida et impera, divide and rule or influence. Uh, again, I, I did not concentrate a lot about this because uh, too many uh, books now, well, again, written, including uh, my friend Ola uh, Bertelstein uh, writing about this uh, Jewish and um, Ukrainian community. But I concentrate on KGB operations against CIA operations. When CIA used uh, Ukrainian and uh, Jewish community against the Soviet Union, um, especially in 50s and 60s when special spy schools were created in West Germany, like Astra Spy School in Regensburg in Bavaria. Uh, and I uh, analyzed files of these schools which were uh, explored by KGB. KGB used double uh, agent strategy, various um, uh, tactics which now they're using against uh, the West uh, from Putin and Russia, trying to undermine, create chaos, provoke, uh, discredit, for example, find information which discredit leaders of, of the school. Eventually they won. By 65, according to my research, all major CIA operations from West Germany using uh, so-called Ukrainian nationalists, Banderovites, failed because of successful KGB operations. It's beginning from the book. And then I proceed with another discovery, which shocked me. Uh, I never, you know, I, I as a human being who live in the United States, who watch uh, all these um, American uh, miniseries, like The Americans or Succession, uh, uh, I, I, I knew about KGB influences, about these uh, sleeping cells, but what we found was shock. I, I just uh, read this first shocking discovery. My first shocking discovery was a number of KGB spies to the United States and Canada from Soviet Ukraine during the 1960s and the 1970s. According to the annual KGB reports, the most important goal of the KGB administration was to prepare the well-trained agents for the intelligence work abroad. Only during one year of 1969, I'm quoting uh, KGB documents, the Ukrainian KGB sent its 23 agents in various international organizations located in the United States. 200 KGB agents traveled in the United States as research specialists, collecting the intelligence information there. 40 KGB operatives worked abroad for hiring the foreigners at the future KGB agents. KGB agents had been already implemented in the US intelligence, 10 of them. 12 of them were implemented in uh, various colleges and universities in the United States and Canada. 40 KGB operatives uh, worked abroad for hiring the foreigners as the future KGB agents including people from both Ukrainian diaspora and Jewish diaspora. Um, uh, two implemented in the Zionist and clerical groups in the USA and Israel. 300 KGB agents were engaged in the counter intelligence operations against the Ukrainian National Center in the United States and Canada, living there as uh, under Canadian and American passports. It's, it's shock. The similar number were reported the almost every year in the 1970s as well. Almost every year during the 1970s, it's, it's official document. You can find this, just go to Fund 16. Um, almost every year during the 1970s, the KG managed to infiltrate approximately 250 to 270 of their agents into various diplomatic, academic, media, and business organizations in the US and Canada, including CNN, Fox News, um, CBS, this is uh, Canadian can, uh, television news, 
uh, creating so-called sleeping cells there for the future intelligence work of the KGB and crew. So again, it's not, uh, you know, I, I, I was shocked when uh, I found this. Then I proceed with direct um, meddling of uh, KGB to, into Canadian and American politics. For example, uh, I uh, found how they used uh, left or communist uh, Ukrainian Canadian, uh, Canadians and uh, Ukrainian Americans. You need to, to understand that almost half or more than half of all communists in Canada uh, are and were and still are of uh, Ukrainian origin. So the, I described this middle how they used uh, Petro Kravchuk, for example, uh, for this. Um, I found documents starting from 1968 that every year uh, Ukraine, uh, Soviet embassy in Ottawa and uh, Washington DC had special uh, uh, instructions for uh, Ukrainian uh, American, Ukrainian Canadian communists uh, trying to instruct them how to present Impose the way of um, uh, uh, you know Soviet politics, and moreover, they not only uh, supported these people uh, you know in moral way, but they gave them money. Uh, for example, uh, I, I, I wrote this in detail on uh, how uh, special arrangements were made uh, for these uh, Ukrainian communists in Soviet Ukraine in hospitals, sanatoria, and resorts to accommodate uh, uh, these Ukrainian members who required medical treatment and rest. Um, in 1959, using the Soviet financial support, Canadian and Ukrainian communist leaders like Kravchuk, for example, founded their own capitalist enterprise, Ukrainska Kneha in Toronto. And then new international tourist company, Globe Tourist, to provide, it still exists by the way, uh, to provide travel facilities for those wishing to visit the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet government granted to this company the legal rights to be the only official representatives of the Soviet travel agency in tourists in Canada and guaranteed it an exclusive monopoly in group travel to Soviet Ukraine. Of course, all members of this uh, Soviet side of this uh, global tours company were KGB um, operatives. So um, I continue on and on. So um, uh, I, I, I do not want to take your time. I just um, give you another very important um, information. Uh, KGB uh, funded not only the communists, but also peace movement in Canada and the United States. And you can find tons of documents about sponsoring these uh, organizations. Um, and not all the politicians, like I al already uh, mentioned, the Democratic Party, uh, various um, uh, senators or politicians from Canada uh, and uh, um, United States. And at the same time, KGB tried to uh, undermine the reputation of those uh, politicians who were anti-Soviet in both Canada and, and uh, in uh, United States blaming uh, these Ukrainian Canadians being, you know, collaborators with fascists, uh, Nazi lovers and so on, and provoking uh, actually a real fights with these guys. Uh, one uh, particular story, uh, which I put in my book, uh, I already mentioned this in uh, my um, presentation during the Shevchenko conference, it's how uh, Soviet KGB used various uh, organizations, anti government organization in the United States and Canada, especially Black Panthers movement. For those of you who never uh, uh, read uh, uh, history books about modern American history, Black Panthers uh, group is the most active Afro-American uh, leftist group, uh, which was created in 1969. And from the early beginning, KGB tried to influence uh, this group. Um, I use those documents from archive, uh, which was related to Soviet Ukraine case. Uh, many activists of Black Panthers movement uh, became college students in historically black colleges um, 
for example, like Howard University in DC. Uh, probably many of uh, my listeners know this school. It's a very good school and actually vice president to Biden uh, recent uh, graduated from the school. But KGB used Black Panthers activists in this um, uh, school to provoke them uh, in demonstration against Ukrainian American diaspora in Washington, D.C. So when, for example, in 1984, um, uh, leaders of uh, Ukrainian uh, community tried to organize anti-Soviet demonstration uh, near uh, Trashevchenko monument in downtown D.C., um, Black Panthers activists who were organized by KGB agents went and physically uh, tried to stop uh, these Ukrainians. Why? Because KGB explained, Black Panthers students, that these uh, white guys from uh, Ukrainian community were fascists, were neo-Nazi, were anti-Semitic and anti-Afro-American you know, uh, activists. So it's one uh, among many other uh, examples of how KGB used uh, various groups in the United States trying to influence uh, politics and political um, uh, decisions. For example, KGB provided with uh, documents and um, films, even documentary films, um, about collaboration between Ukrainians and Nazi uh, occupants. And uh, it was used in both the United States and uh, Canada in the 70s all the time. And you can find deal information in my book about this. And I finished. The last but very important shocking discovery for me was um, uh, the level of technological and um, industrial espionage. Uh, well, I, I just looking through my, my text, uh, how KGB used Mark Smirchansky, businessman from Liberal Party of Canada, who loved Ukraine for their own. But, but anyway, you can read this in my book. Uh, I'm going to this uh, last part of my talk, uh, not about discrediting, not about supporting politicians, but using politicians, using exchange program for stealing secrets. When I opened these documents, I was shocked with uh, level uh, and professional level of this espionage, especially uh, regarding electronics, space industry, um, communication industry. Uh, I have special chapter about how KGB used 16 official United States exhibitions in Kyiv, um, how they stole all these secrets, how they were spying. They, didn't care about uh, various problems of uh, Ukraine uh, patriots, uh, Jew, Jewish Zionists, national. No, they cared about how to steal, how to use, and how to implement uh, these uh, uh, these secrets. Um, so you can find a lot of very boring uh, numbers from '68 how a IBM system were stolen and implemented in Ukrainian Academy of Sciences in Kyiv. So all this Soviet mythology about priority and about uh, you know, advances of uh, Soviet technology and science is not true. It's mythology. Uh, what Soviets did, they stole these secrets. Uh, so, um, uh, I uh, discuss every year from 68 to 85 how much uh, Soviet KGB stole and how they implemented this in Kyiv High Military Aviation Engineering School of the Soviet Air Force and uh, uh, Institute of Cybernetics of the Academy of Science of Ukraine uh, as a science so on. So according to my research, and I quote my book, between 1965, and 1987, almost 90% of all so-called technological innovations, Soviet innovations, in all research institutes and the factories of the military industrial complex of Soviet Ukraine, including my Yuzhmash, Pivden Mash in, 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 in Dnipropetrovsk, were based on the stolen information from the capitalist countries by the specially trained KGB agents. 
and at least 80%, 80% of all those secret samples of important technological interventions came directly from the United States of America. Paradoxically, a majority of these technological secrets were stolen from the American laboratories and colleges by the Soviet engineers and scientists who participated in the international academic exchanges programs and who executed the KGB orders performing the functions of the Soviet spies on the American soil. And to finish my long uh, talk, I need to remind uh, people who listen to our conversation that I wrote this book not just for curiosity's sake. You know, history teaches nothing if we could not implement historical lesson to today's events. And what's going on today, how Putin's administration tried to lie and uh, try to create this fake news. I just yesterday tried to compare uh, Ukrainian news and Russian news, and I was shocked. It's complete disinformation from Russian side. And today's meeting of Blinken and Lavrov, it's another proof that old traditional Soviet legacy to discredit, to undermine, to uh, create chaos in the countries of political adversaries is still working. And all this is covered by lies, by campaign of peace talk. I, I explain all these events of 70s, and you need to remember that these events were, were taking place on the ground of detente. Relaxation of relations between the United States and uh, Soviet Union. And this, this is very uh, important uh, reminder for us how we should be careful today with official propaganda and we need to learn from history how nothing is new under this sun. Thank you. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sergei. Thank you so much for this exceptional revealing information. Uh, we can proceed to our uh, questions. And as I mentioned before, if you would like to participate in our um, discussion directly, uh, please use function raise hand and uh, I'll promote you to a panel status. But so far we have a couple of questions in our Q&A uh, box. Um, I'll start with Walter Dashko. And if you don't mind, I'll read it out, uh, his question. Uh, I'll start with the first one. When I was interviewed by a CSIS agent in Toronto in 1991, I was told that every single Ukrainian organization in Canada has a high place Russian mole or asset. Asked why they don't arrest them, then reply was, we know who they are and the diaspora would be in shock if they ever found out. And since then have been suspicious of certain individuals that behave uncharacteristically. I, I suspect the same situation exists in the USA. Did you find evidence to this KGB documents archives? Yes. And uh, um, Moreover, they, well, well, they did not put uh, pictures, but they uh, sometimes put secret um, so-called KGB names. Uh, for example, when in early 80s, uh, Chervona Ruta, uh, it's a rock band from Ukraine, came to the United States, at least four members of this band, and they put these names, Kachanovsky, um, uh, Shestov, I forgot uh, all these, uh, but these are agent names. It's not real names, of course. The same happened with uh, names of teachers from Toronto, from other schools of Canada. They put a name like Greg, um, Mike, or some of this, but it's not, of course, real name. Um, I, I suggest uh, that uh, people of Secret Service from KGB, from um, United States and Canada should go to, um, to, um, SBU archive that I'm not sure that now SBU would allow them to look through them. I still have this suspicion 
that despite of all openness, forgive me this, KGB is always KGB. And unfortunately, uh, well, with all this a new approach, for example, I could not uh, have access to some uh, documents which I required, frankly speaking. But, but you can try. Yeah. Um, there is another question from Walter as well. Uh, did you find evidence of reflexive control of fake projects against the North American Ukrainian diaspora in the Demyanyuk affair? You know, they, uh, they have this, these documents, but you need to dig uh, deeper. Uh, again, for me, it was the first scratch of these documents. I was so enthusiastic, you know, I remember uh, I began this um, uh, research because my former students who are historians now and teach in different schools, I, I, I was professor at Dnipropetrovs probably, um, you forgot about this. I have many historians, very patriotic historians, like Alia Hrepan, who was fighting with um, uh, Russian aggression in, in Donbass, who actually advised me to go there. And uh, so I began this and I, I spread the news to all my colleagues, to Ole Bergholz, to other people, go there and uh, fight. But, uh, and and uh, dig, excuse me. And um, I started this. So this is my first scratch. I still have. Uh, piles of, of these uh, documents in my in my office uh, here uh, in Indiana, uh, but uh, you need to understand that it was uh, 2018. Uh, they actually help us. They provide us with digital copies of these documents for free. Can you imagine this? Entire um, uh, file 16. Uh, this correspondence between KGB and political leadership of Ky in Kyiv. It could be available on digital uh, um, uh, in digital form, but not uh, counterintelligence uh, file. Uh, this is I uh, just uh, make photos and uh, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, I did not dig deeper. So it's like the first uh, take of what I did. Thank you. And uh, we have a comment and a question from Hiroaki Kurumiya. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for such an illuminating and instructive talk. This is a commentary and one question. First, I hope that some of our academic colleagues are shaking in their pants in fear of revelations of their true colors. Second, in a sense, your revelations are not particularly shocking to me. Konovalets was assassinated by Sudap Platov, who infiltrated OWN. Some branches of OWN um, in the 1930s were headed by a Soviet agent. Third, which is a question, Soviet intelligence penetrated not just communist and leftist organizations, but also rightist and even reactionary organizations. Is there any evidence to this in the Ukrainian archive? Yes. Uh, especially they tried to use uh, this very right, suppose Bender White group of Melnik uh, against Bandera. And uh, their major idea was dividend emperor or discredit this. Um, in the first part of my book, I uh, wrote these spy stories, these wonderful spy stories about how double agents work, how they discredit uh, state score. Uh, and that, and all you know, it, it's it's interesting how all these operations worked uh, using women, uh, men, using sex, uh, um, drugs, alcohol, and so on. Yeah, you're right. But uh, uh, I uh, concentrate on Kravchuk's story because I had already had these documents, and I worked with uh, Petro Kravchuk's uh, uh, daughter. She's my friend, Larisa. Stavrov, she gave me a lot of documents from her father archive. So I, I try to use this, uh, but, yeah, but but again, uh, I uh, uh, I just began this. Probably uh, people who will follow me find a lot. For example, my uh, last chapter is about KGB and uh, this hidden, um, uh, infrastructure of religious opposition, uh, how Adventists, how uh, Pentecostals use the Western connection. Why I did this, why I wrote about this, because it was American connection. It was fight against Brooklyn 
a center of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, witnesses and so on. So, uh, uh, frankly speaking, in my talk, I did not cover uh, the story about hippies and punks. I already told uh, this in my previous lecture, and not about these so-called forbidden lectures where um, uh, different evangelical groups, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, were used uh, by KGB for provoking. And uh, as far as I remember, Hero used the documents about uh, Stalinist uh, persecution of um, uh, Ukrainian evangelicals in the 50s. So I, I remember your wonderful book about this. Yeah, thank you. We have one more question from Sofia Asher. You mentioned that you can pay at news from Ukraine and Russian sources. Could you please give an example of what news sources you used? Thank you. Uh, just uh, two files, uh, two funds. One, uh, fund number one, counterintelligence uh, operations. And as far as I remember from what I read, nobody used this before. And of course, uh, half of my book or two thirds of my book is actually <laughs> citation, quotation of these documents and analysis of these documents. I had no time to analyze everything, frankly speaking. And um, uh, one third of my sources came from Fund 16. It's available. And uh, many people use this before um, or simultaneously with uh, my efforts, like Ole uh, Bertelsen or um, uh, Julian Furst in her wonderful book about hippies. Uh, she used some of these, not very many, but some of these as book documents. But it's formed. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sophie. And I believe we have uh, time for one more question and uh, I will allow myself to ask this question. Um, so in your talk, you uh, mentioned that some KGB agents were of Ukrainian origin and you found it important to underline and it's more like a provocative question, right? I also believe it's important to underline the fact that some KGB agents specifically uh, in this situation were of Ukrainian uh, origin. But uh, when we talk about um, uh, teaching uh, history of the USSR, usually KGB agents Agents. I just presented as Soviets in the best case, in the yeah. worst case, uh, Russian, uh, Russian agents, although they uh, could be, for example, Ukrainians. And uh, in my opinion, such presentation, again, presents the whole history of the uh, Soviet Union as only history of Russia, uh, and it minimizes the visibility of all other constituents of the uh, Soviet history specifically and of the Soviet Union. Uh, it also leads to the contemporary probably stage where the uh, history of um, the Soviet Union is seen as history of uh, Russia, and it contributes to um, all kinds of distorted um, uh, facts about the Soviet Union, about Russia, and about Ukraine in the present moment. So, um, could you could you comment on this um, uh, on this intention, right, to uh, specify uh, what um, what nationalities probably um, were involved uh, in the system of this uh, KG, uh, KGB uh, structure? Yeah. Um, for, the, for the present moment, uh, well, of course, for the yeah. past uh, as well, but for the present. Yeah, moment, I, I partly, I, I partly <laughs> addressed this. I, I was asked about this when I was writing this uh, by some of my colleagues, like Kuzio, others. Um, then uh, I asked by my Canadian friends when they interviewed me. Uh, it's interesting that before uh, 40s. Um, at ethnically, many of these people who were in NKVD, uh, GPU, and uh, KGB before it became KGB in Fibis, like MGB under Khrushchev, were either Russian or Jewish origin. Um, but uh, frankly speaking, it's interesting that after 50s, majority of KGB operatives, and this undermined this very romantic image of a Russian KGB vis-a-vis -vis Ukrainian. Majority of these people were Ukrainians and Jewish. Why Jewish? Because I describe in detail some um, operations of CIA, uh, of, um, it was not CIA operation, but uh, cases when uh, American tourists or American diplomats tried to address Jewish identity of KGB agent explaining that 
in the United States, and nobody you know persecute you for you, you, you being Jewish or some of this. And uh, so at least one third of uh, this um, personnel were Jewish and uh, two thirds were mostly uh, Ukrainians with of course Russians. And they use this for very important reason. Uh, many people who penetrated Ukraine diaspora had to speak fluently Ukrainian. Don't forget this. So we sometimes tend to forget that uh, Ukrainian Soviet Republic was the most, it's another paradox, uh, conservative republic of the Soviet Union. And their pressure against patriotic intellectuals were much bigger than in Russia. Uh, or other republics. And Ukrainian patriots suffered probably more in uh, Ukraine, especially after Khrushchev reforms, than in, in uh, Russia. I wrote about this in my book about Dnipropetrovsk. Why? Because we sometimes forgot that many of uh, these people who became famous representative of Ukrainian intellectual position, you know, put together in this so-called bloc organization were actually very sincere Marxist patriots, but who loved their land. Um, I do an entire chapter of my book on the Pretorius about this paradox, but after persecution of KGB, when they punished them not for, um, you know, Americanism for like these all these hippies or punks or whatever, for their Soviet patriotism. There were Soviet Ukrainian patriots. And these guys who sometimes even graduated from Moscow State University, many of them, you know, in our Ruch movement, for example, they became anti-Soviet because of the persecution. So KGB to some extent prepared this patriotic anti-Kremlin uh, movement. So my, as a historian, I will disagree with you about this Soviet legacy. We became patriots because we suffered from the regime. Being patriotic supporters of this regime, don't play games. All these uh, people who came from Ukraine were graduated from Soviet Ukrainian schools and now they became, they became patriots because we suffered, because many mistakes and many uh, very pro-Kremlin, pro-Russian uh, politic decisions of the center affected us and killed our Soviet patriotism. For example, my generation became anti-Kremlin after Chernobyl. I tried to explain to my Moscow friends, I, I read it from Moscow school as Americans, and they did not believe. I mentioned them, I spent three months in Chernobyl and nobody cared about us. Moscow tried to cover up all this. They poisoned our land, river, and what, what else we have? And uh, then I became Petrus when Putin actually attacked us. Before 2014, uh, yeah, I, I, like many Ukrainian uh, Americans who live in the United States, we, frankly speaking, uh, were very critical about Corruption in Ukraine still exists. Weakness of, of uh, post-Soviet government, stupidity of our politicians, betrayal of Ukrainian interests. Actually, I hated all these Yanukovych. I, I, I don't like uh, recent president. It's my uh, official opinion. But anyway, uh, but we became patriots when so-called Russian brother. I have my brother living in Moscow who for Putin. Can you imagine? And now I can speak to him. Um, he's sick, it's a different story. But anyway, um, uh, we became Petrus when something affected us. I try to explain that all these first Ukrainian Petrus who were uh, presented as bloc, oppositional, pro-American, pro-Canadian, you know, enemies of the people were not enemies. They were great Petrus. They just loved their Ukraine. How I still love my Vatutina, my Zvinigrodka, District, as in Rotsky, yes, my Shevchenko cry. You know, for me, Taras Shevchenko was my John Lennon, you know, John Lennon. You know, it's for people in Moscow, it's very difficult to understand. But believe me, if somebody attacked Moscow, 
they would become very different patriarchs. But we were attacked. We're still under attack. And that's how you know, this logic, patriotic logic works. We replace our traditional value system with a new value system because it's our existential system of defense. We def try to defend, to protect our identity. With all my Russian speaking skills, I still love my Shevchenko crowd. I can replay this. Sorry about this one uh, answer to your good I'm question. also from the Shevchenko Krai, so I also. Yeah, I know, <laughs> Well, I, I just discovered one more question in our Q&A box. Uh, you mentioned um, Ukrainian businessmen in the Liberal Party in Canada were targeted by KGB. Please expand. Yeah, I, I, I can give you uh, his name again. Uh, his name. Uh, well, I have many names. I just put this in my uh, presentation. Uh, Mark Smirchansky uh, was born in 1914, died in 1989 from the Liberal Party of Canada. Uh, it was a period when uh, uh, KGB tried to support six Ukrainian uh, Canadian uh, politicians in Canada. And they uh, supported Smirchalsky because he was a uh, Soviet Ukraine in 67. And KGB noticed his good behavior without any public demonstration of the anti-Soviet feelings. So they noted that he expressed his strong interest in maintaining good trade relations between Canada and Soviet Union. And again, KGB uh, attitude uh, change all the time. For example, in 70s, KGB supported uh, Emilian Pritzak before this in late 60s. Emilian Pritzak was, you know, a uh, member of this pro-fascist, you know, Nazi uh, Ukrainian community. But because Pritzak took moderate position toward Soviet Ukraine, uh, KGB recommended, and I, I put this in my book, uh, support pro-Soviet position of Ukrainian American intellectuals such as Pritzak, a director of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, Kravchenko, one of the leaders of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, uh, Yuri Darevich, uh, physics professor at the University of Toronto, Yuri Gayetsky, professor of history at the University of Chicago. They rejected, I quote document uh, from KGB report, I rejected, they rejected participate in the political actions of Banderovtsi, it's named for um, a radical uh, Ukrainian nationalist, opposed the attitude uh, directed on boycott of the scientific and cultural connection with the Soviet Union. In con contrast to Banderovsky, they demanded, I quote, directing the activities of the Ukrainian immigration to a preservation of the Ukrainian language, culture, and strengthening its cultural role in the social life of the country of their residents, Soviet Ukraine. So it's, uh, uh, KGB operatives were very keen, very uh, uh, wise for, in the, their own terms to analyze behavior of politicians or in this, uh, in this case, uh, people from academia, uh, schools and so on. And they supported those people from Ukraine there. Even who were right, uh, you remember uh, Hiraki Kromea asked me about right? They even supported people from the right, political right, if their position was advantageous for KGB strategy in Canada, Ukraine, or in other part of the West the world. Well, thank you so much, Saki, for this conversation today, and thank you for opening our uh, spring sessions for our Ukraso talks. And of course, congratulations on your upcoming book. And I'm really looking forward to reading this book. And uh, I hope that we will have another conversation for the New Books Network. Now, this global network has a uh, separate channel for the Ukrainian studies. Uh, so I do hope that we will have our interview uh, sometime soon. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Natasha, for having me and promoting my book, <laughs> the end of a April. <laughs> it's on Amazon, so you can you can you can buy this book. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course, thank Jaku. you. Jaku. Thank you, Jaku. Jaku.
Uh, thank you for attending our lecture today. Sergijuk uh, today presented on Ukraine, the KGB, espionage, and meddling in American politics 1960s, 1980s. Information about upcoming events will be posted on the Ukrso listserv and on our Facebook page, Ukrainian Studies Organization at Indiana University. You can view previous lectures and talks on our YouTube channel, and for future recorded events, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Uh, thank you for attending our event today.